Hi, my name is Mikael Laakso, and I work as an associate professor at Hanken School of Economics in Helsinki, Finland. For over a decade, I've been researching the emergence of open access, and in that context, economic aspects have been shown to be especially challenging and important to solve at various levels. I've brought you here to a traditional Finnish sauna, since this is usually an environment where people speak frankly and straight to the point. And I think that is suitable for both the topic and format of this video. But hey, let's get started covering some central points relating to the economics of open access. Before going into open access specifically, I'd like to highlight two key points that relate to scholarly journal publishing in general. First of all, most journals are still based on subscriptions as their primary business and publishing model. And most of the money used by universities and libraries for the purposes of scholarly publishing goes into paying for subscriptions to scholarly journals. Over time, these subscriptions have become increasingly expensive and centralized, so that a large share of the money that goes into scholarly journal publishing goes into the pockets of a few big commercial publishers. And these big commercial publishers haven't really had any reason to hurry up with a rapid full transition to open access, since the subscription-based model has been so profitable and reliable over a long period of time. The second aspect I'd like to highlight before moving on to open access is that authors of articles receive no royalties for selling access to their work. So paywalls of subscription journals have been set up to protect the financial interests of journals and not those of authors. So there is no strong financial motivation from the perspective of authors to retain paywalls, since all of the income and revenue created by a journal is funneled through the publisher and perhaps shared with a scholarly society, but it's not in the interest of authors to lock up work behind paywalls. But now we can move on over to talking about open access specifically. You still with me? Good. We've now reached the main part of the video where I'll present some, in my view, essential concepts uh, and topics for better understanding the economics surrounding open access. I'll be jumping a bit when it comes to focus points and analysis levels, so rather than trying to create cumbersome segues between them, since I'll be moving at a pretty brisk pace due to this video being short, I've decided to split each separate aspect into a separate video segment. Let's start with the first one. To start our thinking around this complex topic, I think it's important to differentiate between cost and price. Because just by looking at the final price of something, it's rarely possible to tell what the actual costs have been to produce the service or product. For commercial companies, there's often incentive to try to lower costs and increase the price in order to maximize profits, while non-profits and charitable organizations might try to sell things at cost or even uh, get costs covered by some other mechanism than baking it into the final price of a product. A very simple but often overlooked fact when it comes to the context of organizations operating in scholarly publishing is that commercial companies and in particular publicly traded commercial companies are expected to grow their profits over time. That growth can come from increasing the pricing of existing products and services or then expanding into new segments coming up with new products and services, but there needs to be revenue growth. Because a large part of the share price on the stock market uh, is constructed around expectation of future profits and how those are going to grow. 
And I think this needs to be kept in mind as soon as we start thinking about lowering costs and how to transition from the current fairly expensive subscription-based environment to something that is built around open access. Something very important that relates to the journal publishing environment is that individuals, uh, for example researchers, might have many different roles to play in the system. They are probably readers interested in reading the works of others. They are perhaps authors wanting to publish their own research in journals that they know their colleagues and peers will read. They are, might be reviewers reviewing the works of others to be published in journals, and they might even act on editorial boards of journals. So they have many different potential hats, and that makes change challenging when it comes to making journals interchangeable or commodities, so to say. And that's also putting pressure on library negotiations with publishers, because the faculty and affiliated researchers might be very attached to certain journals by certain publishers, making hard bargaining challenging. As of July 2019, there are around 13,500 journals included in the Directory of Open Access Journals. Most of these journals are free to publish in, which means that the price is zero. Neither readers or authors have to pay anything. But that doesn't mean that the cost of these journals would be zero. It just means that the costs are covered by some other means than author-facing charges. Often these journals might be sponsored by a university or a scholarly society, or they can be run on a volunteer basis with very minimal financial costs involved. The spectrum of journals that charge article processing charges is broad. The prices range from tens of dollars to multiple thousands of dollars. Walt Crawford has produced annual calculations of what the average price of an APC of an article published in a journal included in the DOAJ is. For 2018, the average price for an article was $900. That includes the free ones. If we only look at journals which charge a fee, the average price was $1,500. One excellent development that has been happening parallel to open science growing is that the openness of the economy surrounding scholarly publishing is increasingly open and transparent, even though there is still a long way to go. But many individual libraries and consortia around the world have started publishing the amounts uh, of money paid to various publishers or even the complete contracts signed with various publishers openly on the web to increase the transparency of the costs involved with the scholarly publishing system. One great initiative related to this is the Open APC initiative, which is also a website where institutions from around the world are submitting article processing charges they have paid which makes it possible to look at the costs of publishing on a journal level, uh, publisher level, or even in some cases a national level, if the data is comprehensive from that particular country. I really recommend looking up the Open APC initiative to see where transparency in terms of these prices is going. I think a really fascinating topic in the context of scholarly publishing is market competition. So-called perfect competition happens when kind of the competitors or providers in a marketplace offer goods that are largely substitutable, so that as a consumer or end user you can choose your own provider, 
and have the providers compete on aspects such as price and service quality, which usually drives costs down and service quality up. The problem with the journal publishing landscape is that the goods aren't really substitutable, in a sense. In the subscription-based world, you couldn't really substitute the content in one journal with that of the other, if you were an interested reader. It was basically a mini-monopoly, as Peter Suber, I think, coined it, in that each journal has more freedom to set its price, since the content within it is unique and non-substitutable. From the perspective of authors, journals are also not substitutable. And this also goes for the open access world. Research evaluation, as it still exists today, even though there is slowly change happening, there's a large emphasis on where you publish. So the prestige of the journal or the exclusivity, or it's just internal ranking within the research discipline has mattered a lot for evaluations of individual researchers, university rankings, and even entire countries are, are ranked based on where the research produced is published. And this means that even open access journals can have more freedom in setting their prices. There's already enough money in the system. That's a quote by Rolf Schimmer of the Max Planck Institute, who calculated that we are currently using around $4,000 per article in the subscription-based system in global subscription fees. So we are essentially paying a communal $4,000 APC per article in subscription-based journals, and it's still locked behind a paywall. So there seems to be a large potential to save money by flipping over to open access. The problem is that this stage of transition that we are currently in, where we are both paying subscriptions and paying for APCs in open access journals, is expensive. Article processing charges are deceptively simple, I think. They are much more complex than one would think about when first being introduced to the concept, because just by looking at an APC, the price asked for processing an article for a publication, it's not really possible to discern what it actually costs to produce the article. Some of the numbers I've seen reported recently put the price of producing an article through professional publishing and copy editing processes at in the hundreds of dollars rather than the thousands asked by some journals. But there's a lot of fixed costs involved in journal publishing, which kind of supports this economies of scale operations that has also fueled the growth of commercial publishers that the first articles have a high per article cost for the journal, but once you increase the volume somewhat, you can start dividing those fixed costs, administration, accounting, copy editing, services. I would like to highlight a kind of cautionary note when we are now thinking in the lines of economic efficiency and flipping entire publishing systems from one to the other and, and kind of thinking outside the box is also including global inclusiveness because we shouldn't just be moving the paywall from readership to authorship. That's a large risk for the research system as a whole and even though most open access journals have waiver policies and differential pricing for, for authors from different nationalities I do not see the future, the long-term future for open access publishing to be based off of individual APCs and exceptions to payment of those APCs to be kind of optimal solution. It has many problematic aspects. So I would personally prefer to see more back-end solution, more system-level funding, rather than tying each 
article acceptance to a financial transaction and, and, a, and a process like that. Even though the big commercial publishers haven't really been eager to flip their existing subscription-based journals to open access, they have been pretty keen on adding the option of offering hybrid open access to authors. So hybrid open access is when you can pay an optional article processing charge as an author and then get your article published open access in an otherwise subscription-based journal. This option has become increasingly popular, but it doesn't seem to have an effect on subscription prices, which I earlier also mentioned has, has been kept on increasing. So many doubt the sustainability of this model where you are paying both full and high price for subscriptions and also paying expensive hybrid open access fees, which are all often in the thousands of dollars and on average more expensive than article processing charges in full open access journals. I think many, especially early on in the development of open access publishing, thought that maybe open means less expensive and maybe even free. But at least in the context of large commercial publishers where open access has been introduced as a component to publisher agreements, that has not been the case. Several countries and library consortia in Europe have made new types of agreements with big scholarly publishers, which cover and include both subscription access as well as paying for the possibility to publish hybrid open access in the publisher's journals, either completely free in the terms of the authors not having to pay anything upon acceptance, or then getting a discount for open access publishing as part of the agreement. And from what can be perceived from the different cost data sets and the contracts that have been published, this hasn't really meant savings yet. So far, open access in this context and in this kind of trans formative stage, whatever we call it, where we are paying for essentially two systems in parallel, it's only been more and more expensive. It will be interesting to see if this type of contract and agreement will spread more globally. So far it's been fairly contained to Europe. We'll see how other countries around the world are willing and able to adopt such, such agreements. I think it's also important to acknowledge that science policy has been quite a force affecting both the economics of open access, but also which types of models have become more or less established in the landscape. Science policy can come in many different flavors and from, from various directions, but uh, research funders have been one very visible and impactful force shaping in particular open access. Research funders might have mandates on what type of open access they accept or a maximum amount of money that they will reserve and give for paying an article processing charge. And of course, all of these decisions shape in what way open access develops overall, also outside of the funded research. There's also the element of science policy when it comes to national funding of journals. So national journals might get support depending on what publishing model they adopt. For example, in Norway, journals which publish open access get governmental funding while subscription-based don't. So that's of course a very strong incentive to flip over to open access. So I think it's important to keep in mind that it's not only the pure economics in terms of demand and price that guide things and shape things in the context of open access. Science policy is also a very important force to be 
reminded of. I think it would be foolish to not mention that Latin America in particular has been very exemplary in facilitating open access among journals published in the region. The Cielo portal is I think an excellent demonstration of how one can, could arrange control and ownership of journals to facilitate both open access and low barriers to participations, since few journals operate on an article processing charge. This of course requires that the kind of national environment and the scholarly environment supports, and both financially and in terms of getting merit from doing volunteer work to journals and also keeping journals in the control of universities and societies. There's currently great promise in so-called library consortia funding models for operating open access journals. Open Library of Humanities is a great example of how participating institutions, hundreds of different libraries and universities around the world, are paying annual fees to keep a portfolio, a growing portfolio of journals open access where authors can publish for free. So the publication of articles isn't in any way tied to the fee paid by consortium members. It's still unknown how well this model can scale to a broader set of journals, to a broader set of institutions, and to broader uh, research disciplines as well, beyond just the humanities. But I think this is something that shows promise for growth and for the future where there are minimal obstacles for global participation. I can really start to feel the heat now, so I have to remove myself soon. But before I go, I want to thank you for hanging on this long, and I have two concluding remarks before I let you go. The first one relates to this discussion that's been so fixated on money in this video. And I think the key point with doing research shouldn't be about money. Research is done in order to be used, read, create impact as widely as possible. And from the perspective of what's best for scholarly communication, retaining and growing profits quarter by quarter and annually, it's not really a condition other than commercial publishers share in this space. So that's why I would strive and encourage other actors to also rethink and make some structural changes to how things are run now and in the future. And among research performing organizations like universities and research funders and libraries around the world, I would encourage more collective action, collaboration both nationally and internationally, since currently many of these global publishers are acting internationally and they gain benefits of scale, economies of scale, and also a good standardized information structure from it. It would be beneficial if also this academic end would strive for the same, to establish common standards, common infrastructures, and also create systems for disseminating research publications, which wouldn't be profit first. Those are my concluding remarks. I wish you a happy day.